Hi, everybody. It's Steve Gorin here. This is a very crazy time of year here. Just about to have a house bill that might pass that might upset the apple cart on the last 36 years of planning. So today we're doing um, the TCLE on note modifications, reorganizing private businesses, and trust sales of business interests. Um, before we be, before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q and A widget at the bottom of your screen. Now, by the way, when I was took economics in college, we we always talked about widgets, and I hadn't really talked about them much until now. Um, we will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. A copy of today's slide as well as other reference materials are available in the resource widget. You can find answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 general credit, in Missouri for 1.8 general credit, and 1.5 general credit in Texas, which is pending, and in New York, 1.5 general um, hyphen experience, 1.5 general hyphen transitional. We award CLD based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. From time to time, a pop-up screen will appear asking you to select a word, a secret word. Simply select the word and click Submit. Our system will capture your response. The certification icon located at the bottom of the screen will only tell you if you have met our criteria for awarding CLE. It does not include the certificate of attendance. Once we have verified your attendance, your certificate will be emailed later. This webinar is being recorded and will be available within 24 hours. You can access it from our website, www.thompsoncoburn.com. All in attendance will also receive a link to the recording. Please do not hesitate to share it with other professionals who may find it useful. And of course, if certain parts stand out, then they can fast forward the recording to those parts. We value your opinions and appreciate your participation in the course. Uh, also, at the end, you can, you'll can you have a chance to comment on what you thought about the timing of this webinar. Uh, normally, I do this at noon central time, but we got pushed back to four central time, uh, and, and so I just want to hear the impact. Okay. So, an overview, uh, we have uh, three different parts. So, when a note modification constitutes an exchange, um, paying a note in kind and discounting the note. And this first topic, I, I consider it to be evergreen, um, but I also consider it to be very relevant to the proposed House bill, um, and I will be making comments on that. Now, the other two topics are not directly tied into what's going on with the House bill. So they, they are important things and helpful. Um, those of you who would like to hear it but don't have the time because you're scrambling, you can always just decide uh, to log off and listen to this later on. So uh, I just wanted to give you that option, but I certainly hope that everybody stays for the 90 minutes because I am too. Okay, so we're going to the, the the second item is moving the S corporation into a partnership uh, because there there is something in the uh, proposed tax law that would allow um, certain S corporations to elect to be partnerships without a tax consequence. And what we're but what we're going to talk about is what you can do regardless of this option. So I will also talk about. Just a, very briefly, a 2021 private letter ruling on isolating business liabilities, liabilities, and very briefly, we'll talk about IRS practice units, which are the IRS in giving resources to its examiners so that they can think about the issues as they go and audit our returns. So those are always, it's always helpful to see things through the lens of the IRS. And then finally, we will talk about um, ESBT and QSST issues when 
a trust sells uh, S corporation stock. In particular, we'll, we'll talk about setting off grantor trust powers so that you, so the grantor doesn't get taxed on, on that portion, whatever he, the grantor doesn't want to get taxed on. We'll talk about, about that nuance. And there's a, there's a very brief comparison to partnerships included in that as well. All right, on to the topics. So, note modifications. So, we know with the House bill that if there's an exchange between a grantor and a grantor trust that uh, that proposed code section 1062 would say that that is not going to um, get protected from by the grantor trust rules. So, if there's an exchange um, then, then it, it may very well be taxed. Um, there's also the possibility of if there's a contribution to a grandfather trust, a pre-enactment trust, that that may taint the trust. And the word contribution um, appears to have been chosen to encompass a wide variety of items. And we'll see when the Rules Committee gets done with the House bill uh, before they try to before they go to enact it, uh, whether they have any type of clarification of that or they put it into the the blue book or legislative history or anything like that. Uh, but I think we have to be on the lookout for the idea that if you have an exchange that that is going to taint your grandfather trust, and a lot of people are used to having you know, sales to irrevocable grants or trust, and they might at some point want to modify their notes or prepay the notes or whatever. And so the question of whether that change is an exchange, it, it will, would become more relevant under the House bill. Okay, so let's look at what the regulations say about whether a modification of a debt instrument is an exchange for purposes of the income tax recognition. So uh, a, a significant modification is an exchange of the original debt instrument for the modified instrument. Um, if, if the modified instrument differs materially either in kind or in extent. So we're gonna kind of flesh out these, these ideas. So on the slide four, a modification is any alteration of the payors or payees legal rights or obligations unless the change is according to the note terms and is not a per se modification under the rules. So, so by the way, at the top of the slide, you'll see a reference to in the parenthetical, a little small one there in, in Roman numeral 2G32. So in the resource widget, you, you should have not only the slide, but also uh, my big PDF, uh, which is which is now over 3,000 pages long. So you you can you can download that, and and then you can go and find 2G32 there. Uh, normally, I do have my newsletter attached uh, with with this with with a narrative explanation of what we're going through. And I don't have my newsletter ready because I've been swamped, as the rest of you have been, uh, with uh, with this potential tax law change. Uh, but my newsletter is in production, and it should be out relatively shortly. Okay. Um, so modification. Uh, it, so if it if it unless the change is allowed per the note. So a very common thing I like to do with the sale to an irrevocable grantor trust is we would have interest only for for just under nine years, and then it all matures uh, just before the ninth anniversary of the note, and and that's when the principal is due. But the the borrower has the right to prepay the note at any time. So even though the, the, the principal is not due until maturity. If the borrower prepays 
that is not a modification because the borrower already had the right to prepay. So the prepayment is simply under the terms of the note. So this is another reason why I really like having a note that's interest only uh, with, with a balloon principle at the end is I don't have to worry about forbearance or principal uh, installments that are due. Um, so, uh, and so the, the, the idea of, of deferring principal installments um, could wind up running afoul of some of this. So, uh, so really, you know, think, think hard about when the maturity date should be and, and uh, you know, you know, take it out maybe a little bit longer. Uh, now, I do the just under nine years, not just so I can get the midterm AFR, but in the in the bad old days, so when people just basically did C corps or general partnerships and they didn't have any other alternatives, um, what would happen is people would want to take their earnings out of the C corp without declaring a dividend, and so what they might do is put a dollar into their C-Corp and then loan $100,000 for the startup capital. And that $100,000 loan was really kind of, for a lot of, a lot of people, it was more like a permanent capital. And, and then they would just get their interest back and then the corporation could deduct that interest and then on that note, and then they have interest income. Um, or if they pay back, in my example, that $100,000, it would just be a repayment of a note. It wouldn't be considered to be a dividend, even though the corporation was using earnings to repay that, that $100,000 note. So litigation ensued, as one can imagine, and there was all kinds of litigation on debt equity ratios and, and also how far out does it go when it looks like it's permanent capital? And if it looks like it's permanent capital, you know, that's like equity potentially. And when you think about a note, and you think about a trust, and you think about equity, and if you think about the grantor retaining some kind of equity interest in the trust, you know that, that begins to look like a retained interest potentially. So the concern is if you go too far out with a note, then it looks more like a retained interest in the trust. So I generally try to make my notes, first of all, less than the life expectancy of, of the lender, um, and I also try to tie them to what's kind of a reasonable repayment schedule. So I feel comfortable in those debt equity cases at, at nine years or less. Uh, when you start getting out at, you know, a dozen years or, you know, somewhere in the teens or longer, then, then I start getting concerned about some of those cases. And I kind of look for, is there a business purpose for extending a note that long? And I mean, the business purpose might be well, that's what the cash flow is going to is expected to be for the investment, and and if that's a realistic repayment term. So you know, so then I'll go with the longer term if that's what we need for a realistic repayment term. When you have a huge corporation um, that, that could have gone public potentially, but they just kept private for their own, you know, for their own reasons, uh, then they tend to have a higher um, multiple of, of earnings to um, – of value to earnings, and, and it usually winds up taking longer to pay off the note. So, um, so I, do go, I, I do go out further with, with larger companies um, on the note, uh, or, or there may be other reasons too, like if you have a split dollar life insurance arrangement, then you can just go for the life of the insured and the split dollar regs let you do that, uh, you know, the 1.7872-15. So, so those, those let you do that. Um, so anyway, um, I didn't really int intend to go on and on about how long you should have the note out for, but uh, it, it does make sense to give yourself some cushion there in that because we don't want to have to have a modification. So a modification is significant only if it alters legal rights or obligations in an economically significant matter. And then on slide five, this is this is straight from the regulation. A change in yield um, is significant um, if the yield varies from the annual yield on the unmodified instrument by more than the greater of 
um, a quarter of 1% or 5% of the annual yield of the unmodified instrument. So there's kind of your safe harbor in changing interest rates. You know, a lot of people like to refinance their notes when the, in, when the AFR drops. I don't really do that so much when I do sales to irrevocable grants or trusts. I mainly just do that when you have straight out loans. Um, but um, but that's just a matter of, um, I'm just very conservative on that particular issue. Uh, and so, so I tend not to just go out and, and refinance if it's a sale of a business interest. Um, uh, anyway, so you can see that if you are refinancing to drop your interest rate, because uh, there's a, a significant benefit, you can see that that could, could consider be considered to be a um, an, an exchange of the note, and you know could be bad under the new under the new law if that passes. All right, another uh, material deferral of scheduled payments is a significant modification unless it falls in the safe harbor. Um, so, uh, and and you can defer that by either extending the final maturity date or by deferring payments before maturity. And then I have the safe harbor in here. The safe harbor period begins on the original due date of the first scheduled payment that is deferred. And then it extends to a period for the lesser of five years or 50% of the original term of the instrument. And, 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 and then there's some uh, rule about being able to defer an unused portion of the safe harbor. Um, so, let's go on to the next part. Uh, other things to consider, a change in the obligor might be some kind of a modification. So, if there's a trust division, does that count? I never really have thought of that as, as a modification, but I don't know. I mean, and, and we need to be concerned about what um, about what how the you know Congress is what Congress is going to do and what how the Treasury is going to respond uh, to this to the sweeping legislation. So changing the obligor or security can be a modification. Uh, changing the nature of the debt instrument, um, accounting or financial covenant. So all of those things that you need to consider. And now we're going to go to polling for today's secret word. Today's first secret word is autumn. So please correct the, select the correct secret word from the selections below. Okay, it looks looks like we've had enough time for people to answer the poll. Um, I did have some questions about maybe building options into notes and, um, you know, an exercise of an option. Uh, we'd have to see whether that constitutes an exchange or not. So um, we have, have to do a little bit more uh, digging into that. Um, so let's go on to... All right, the next point, so payment in kind. So it's not unusual for people to, in the grant or trust context, say, well, if I don't get enough cash flow to, to pay back the note, uh, if my assets went up in value, then I can just repay it in kind. I mean, grats, you repay in kind, what about a note? So, uh, so first of all, of course, that would be an exchange if you if you repay the note in kind. But I also 
worry about um, if if what you're selling might constitute a security, um, then I think about code section 1058. Um, so again, we're here on slide 10. And uh, code section 1058 says that if you loan securities, um, what has to happen to count that as the loan of the securities so that the borrower is loaning the securities and not selling them to the lender? And code section 1058 has here, you know, this, these bullet points about what you have to do to have a loan of securities. And when you look at that, I mean, basically, the all of the equity in the loan security has to come back to the lender. So. It concerns me if somebody has securities that are sold to a trust for a note that's expected to repay with its securities. Where if the IRS says, hey, okay, you said it was a note, you said it was for cash, but that's not what you intended. You intended to repay it in kind with securities. So could the IRS assert that, um, that this is really not a cash loan, but rather a loan of a security? <clears throat> So you you might consider making cash flow projections showing realistically how the note will be repaid. Now, I have a question mark by this uh, because I had a client who pushed back on me on this. He said, Steve, if I make a schedule, a payment, and we we publicize that in some manner, like maybe like you know that this is in it's in everybody's notes that this is a schedule of payments. Um, and like so, we we do have you know the interest only with the balloon, but but we really have a schedule of payments to to show how we're going to retire the note. Well, if I make a schedule of payments and then I don't stick to it, then could the IRS come back and criticize me for that? So this client refused to provide me with a schedule of, of payments uh, based on what he was going to project. Um, so I still would be more comfortable if I had that projection of payments just because I would feel as the lawyer who's orchestrating the transaction um, that it really is based on a fundamental cash repayment model. Uh, so I would definitely prefer that. Uh, but I also respect the client's concern. And if you do make some kind of cash projections, consider keeping that in a privileged file. And, and if you wind up getting an IRS audit, and if the IRS says you intended to repay that in kind, you know, then maybe you just pull that out of the drawer and say, hey, you know, here here's the schedule we had and here's our reasons for it. Of course, it wouldn't be privileged anymore, but um, it, it could it could help go with that intent. And it is and it would be contemporaneous documentation. So it would have, um, you know, some significant weight uh, potentially. So. So whether or not to do the schedule, I don't know, but. I really do uh, go to clients and 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 really kind of beat them up on wanting to have the the cash. Okay. Um, what about valuing notes? So there is a regulation project about about valuing notes that still. Still, still has not been um, released yet. Um, some people do say, well, you could discount the promissory note because maybe the debtor is not as credit worthy. And of course, I, I really don't like the idea that 
you could provoke the IRS examiner because you say the note was worth full value for gift tax purposes, but then you say it's discounted for estate tax purposes. So those are inconsistent positions, and that may infuriate the, exa the examiner, even if it is perfectly correct and proper under the tax law because gift tax and estate tax are different. They actually do have different valuation rules uh, in, in several areas. And the promissory note is one of those. <clears throat> so I'm good, but I don't I don't wanna play on on that quite as much. I mean that is that is a big issue. And then, you know, client could push back and say, Well, we'll deal with it then. If they get mad about it, then you know, we'll just have to give in. And maybe we won't get as much of the discount. But my question back anybody who asked me about discounting notes is not just about uh, enraging the IRS examiner, but I'm going to, I'm going to appeal to the client's pocketbook because when you have a reduced basis in a note, that means when the print, the principal is taxable and collected. Uh, and so that, that discount eventually comes back to be taxable. And it could be taxable as, as ordinary income or capital gain. And my materials go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, unfortunately, we don't have regulations on everything um, or really anything that, that, I, that would really help with some of these issues. Um, but really federal and state income tax rates may be higher than the state tax rate. So, Discounting the note may be that gives you something with a time value of money, but it it might not save you tax. And in a lot of states, like we have offices in California and New York, and and if if you look at the at the federal rate and the state rate, I mean even even capital gains tax rates may be higher than federal and state tax. So I'm not really excited about discounting promissory notes. So uh, I, I really haven't done that. Okay, so proposed legislation. Um, and, and this really is just about all I'm gonna be speaking about proposed regulations. I did have some questions in the chat and, um, and I'll, I'll make one comment on it at the end, but that's really all that I'm gonna comment on it. So under the proposed regulations, any exchange with an irrevocable grant or trust subjects the parties to income tax consequences. And, and like I said, it could taint grandfathered irrevocable grant or trusts. So you should consider whether any outstanding notes involving irrevocable grants or trusts are likely to be paid in cash within their current schedule. And if they're not gonna be paid in cash, then consider that paying in kind, again, there could be a taint, there could be a ta an income tax consequence. So, you know, if you can, before the legislation in is enacted, just, you know, fix it and, and try to maybe forgive some of the node or, or, um, or, or get some assets in the trust that can be used to repay it that are high basis assets. Um, so, uh, so do what you can because I, I am trying to avoid anything being done, any exchanges of property for a note. Um, somebody asked if I've heard about the um, about it, whether this is likely to get enacted or not. Um, so the really big thing, which is going to hugely impact the size of the infrastructure bill is that uh, Senator Sinema uh, says increasing overall rates isn't really what we need. She says what we really need is just the loophole closers. Uh, and I have yet to hear a public outcry that says, save our irrevocable grantor trust. Save our sales to irrevocable grantor trust. It's just not there. I think that the, the biggest thing we've heard is, of course, the life insurance 
uh, industry uh, would certainly um, not want the um, these these punitive provisions in proposed code section 2901 to apply to life insurance trusts because we know that life insurance trusts are generally grantor trusts so so and and you'd have existing life insurance trusts that have future premiums so you'd have contributions to grandfather trusts so i think that there's a there is a, a big concern and very rightly so by the insurance industry about irrevocable life insurance trusts getting potentially tainted by this and could there be some kind of an exception so um you know i i do think the life insurance industry's concerns um may very well be reflected in the final legislation but there's there's no assurance of that so we're in a really rough spot with clients to say let's fund all your future premiums and life insurance um ar arrangements now just in case there's not an exception. Um, but knowing that there probably will be an exception, you know, it, it can make us look foolish. So I think we need to just tell clients both things, um, that there may be exceptions from these rules, but we don't know what they are. We can't count on them. If they want to take risk, it's up to them. Uh, even if we think that there's a, that there, that it's likely that there'll be an exception, uh, we certainly are not the experts on politics. I don't even think the politicians themselves know what's going to be in the final bill. So all we can do is is, is tell clients, you know, that here are some possibilities, but uh, we can't promise anything and and just take the most cautious approach as if the worst thing is going to occur under the bill. Um, so that's all I have to say about that, as, as Forrest Gump would say. Uh, that's all I got to say about that. Okay, so all done talking about the House bill. We're going to talk about reorganizing private businesses. So I'm going to talk about why to migrate an S corporation to partnership, which a lot of you know, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. How to migrate an S corporation to partnership. So those are really going to be the bulk, the bulk of this next half hour you know, or so. Um, I'd say probably like you know, a good 20 to 25 minutes of it is going to be, going to be those first two bullet points. And then I'm going to talk about a recent private letter ruling, and I'll talk about these IRS practice units. Okay, so partnership versus S corporation. A, a lot of people say that they're equivalent, and uh, because in, in both cases, the owners are taxed on their distributive shares of the entity's income. Uh, no matter how much actually gets distributed um, and and then you get a lot of accountants who put people into s corporations so that they can save self-employment tax so um, there's potential legislation that all that deals with the self-employment tax and then investment income tax issues and stuff like that and i'm not i'm not going to really get into it um senator wyden also has a proposal that would uh, make partnerships extremely unattractive and try to push people into s corporations um but um you know i don't know whether widens thing is going to go anywhere uh anyway so some say that partnerships and s corps are equivalent but they're not uh, the transfer of a partnership interest by a sale or by death allows a buyer or beneficiary to get an inside basis step up and an outside basis step up Whereas with an S corporation, you get only an outside basis to step up. And I'm going to go through what this means in a moment. So if you can get an inside basis to step up, that means that the entity's assets get a new basis. So that means that the transferee, whether it's a buyer or a beneficiary, the transferee can take depreciation deductions based on that higher basis. Or if the partnership sells the assets, there's less gain on sale. Um, and I'll also mention that an S corporation might replicate some of this basis step up if it sells all its assets and liquidates in the same year. And I'll talk about a little bit of uh, limitation on that as well. So, so first I'm going to illustrate an S corporation problem. So S corporation has assets with zero basis and a million dollars value. 
Sam Sucker buys 50% of the stock for $500,000. The assets are sold. So they were based on million dollar value. So there's a million dollar gain on sale. And Sam owns 50% of that. So he's got a $500,000 share of the gain. And the S Corporation gives him a K-1 for the 500,000 share of the gain. Now, this is very unfair to Sam. He just paid $500,000 cash. The assets being sold gave him no economic gain whatsoever. And yet, he's going to get taxed on a $500,000 a gain, even though he got no gain whatsoever and just put in $500,000 of cash. <clears throat> Sam's only consolation is he is a proud owner of a $1 million basis in stock that's worth $500,000. And that's a $500,000 purchase price plus the $500,000 K-1. So down the road, you know, he could take a $500,000 loss on the stock when he sells it. But, you know, again, that's some small consolation if he holds this for any period of time. Okay, Smart Sally finds a partnership with the same characteristics. Assets with a zero basis and a million dollar value. Sally buys a 50% partnership interest for $500,000. So same deal as Sam. But in this case, the partnership makes a code section 754 election, which would give Sally a $500,000 basis in her half of its assets. The assets are sold. She has no gain on sale because she had the $500,000 of basis and 500,000 of proceeds, <clears throat> so there's no gain on sale. So she just keeps her $500,000 basis. And if the assets are not sold, she's happy with any depreciation. So Smart Sally got a much better deal than Sam Sucker. Now I'm gonna change it a little bit. We're moving on slide 18 and in this case, we're having a sole owner of an S-Corp, and that sole owner, um, their estate planning matures. And, and so, so, um, so now they've died, they get a basis come up in their stock, and now the S-Corp goes to sell the stock. So it's, it's a million dollars asset inside the S-Corp with no basis, a million, since they owned it 100%, it's a million dollars basis in the stock. So let's see how that plays out. So the the million dollars of assets are sold to a third party for a million dollars gain. The basis of the real estate was zero and the gain on the K-1 is a million dollars. No surprise there. The next thing that happens here is that now we're going to see what is, what is our basis. Well, there was a million dollar basis stuff up at death and a million dollars gain on the K-1. So there's $2 million of stock basis after the sale of the assets. So if you liquidate the corporation and take the million dollars of cash out and you had a $2 million stock basis from the prior slide, that's a million dollar long-term loss on the liquidation. So the long-term capital gain of a million dollars on the K-1 is offset by the million dollar long-term capital loss on liquidation, so there is a net zero. All right, now, if this is depreciable or amortizable property, um, then in my example, you would have had to sold that sell, sold those assets to a third party. And that's because code section 1239 says that a controlled corporation that sells depreciable assets will have ordinary income. And if they had ordinary income, then that ordinary income would not be offset by that capital loss. So if you just liquidated the corporation, um, then you'd have, there'd be a concern on that. There's also a state income tax disconnect. So I live in Missouri, and let's suppose we have a decedent 
who lived in Missouri, and they had an S corporation, and it has it, and the S corp has real estate in Illinois. This actually is a real case that occurred a number of years ago that I was involved in, and um, I didn't do the planning, but I had to I had to try to clean up the consequences. So the you know in this example. Um, if you you sold the real estate, you'd have a million dollars of Illinois source gain. But when you liquidate the corporation, stock is sourced is cited to where the owner lives, and the owner lives in Missouri. So the loss on the liquidation of the S corp was Missouri source income, not Illinois source income. So from an Illinois viewpoint, we were not able to offset the loss on liquidation against the Illinois source income from the sale of the real estate. So there was a state income tax income tax disconnect there. And if that real estate had been owned by a partnership or an LLC tax of the partnership, then you know, then and and, and that LLC had been included in the decedent's estate. Then we would have been able to get the inside basis step up, and we wouldn't have had to worry about that offset not applying. Oh, so the other thing, another couple of consequences on this. So, so first of all, if you had depreciable personal property, the disposition of that is always ordinary income. Uh, and and then the other thing is you have to liquidate in the same year in which you sell those assets. That's the only way your, your, your capital loss and liquidation is going to offset the gain. If you, if you get the gain in year one, liquidate in year two, you can't carry back that loss, that capital loss, into year one. So that is a problem. Um, and, and the other thing is, suppose you have, you're in a, in a multi-member thing, like you had in our, in our prior example when we had uh, Sam Sucker, he was a 50% owner. Well, you know, his, his uh, you know, co-owner um, may have had, you know, zero basis in their stock. And, uh, and they might not have wanted to liquidate because they wouldn't have had an offsetting loss necessarily. So, so there are a lot of problems with that. So partnerships are definitely better than S corporations in many, many cases. So now, how do you move from a corporate structure into a partnership structure? So I'm gonna just go through some of the steps and and then talk about the income tax consequences at, at the end of this list of steps. So, a uh, corporation needs to form a new LLC. So the, the most obvious one might be the corporation creates a new LLC that's a disregard entity, migrates the entire business into it, and and then and then it has that LLC. And you know that can be, you know, you 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 can tailor how much stays inside the corporation, how much goes into the LLC. Um, so that that can be helpful, uh, but. It, it, it can be cumbersome um, you might, because you have a piecemeal transfer of assets and some assets might not be readily transferable. And think about people who have state licenses um, and, and you really want it and those kind of go to stay with the entity and transferring those licenses could be a pain. Okay, so a more the most common way to do it is to do what's called an S reorganization, and you can see at the top of the slide I have that that cross reference to two P three H, which is to um, reorganizations under Internal Revenue Code section three sixty eight parentheses A parentheses one parentheses capital F as in Frank, which is why it's called an S reorganization. So, so th this is this is what tends to be done in the very large majority of the cases. So you have A, B, and C with the shareholders of the existing corporation, and they form a new corporation. 
So you have your, your S Corp, for example, and, and you form a new S Corp, and then you transfer your stock in your old S Corp to the new S Corp. So you can see here on slide 27 that A, B, and C own the new the new C corp, and then the and then the old S corp becomes the disregard entity. So you file uh, the IRS form 2553 to elect the S election for the new corporation, uh, and and then and you also um, have what's called the Q sub election where you say that the old corporation is now a disregard entity of the new one. And, and, the, and the new corporation um, gets all the tax attributes of the old corporation. And, and so, so really, A, B, and C, instead of being shareholders in the old corporation, they're shareholders in the new corporation without any income tax consequences to that transaction whatsoever. Then the old corporation either converts under state law or merges into an LLC, that's a disregard entity. So you wind up on the right-hand side of the slide, A, B, and C own the new corporation, which has the same tax attributes as the old one, and then there's an LLC disregarded entity. And you get to move all assets to one fell swoop, which is great, um, but you might need to put um, some of the other um, some of the assets back into the parent, into the into the new corporation, uh, if you want to keep something out of the LLC, and um, and you need to contribute the stock of the old corporation to the new corporation, pretty much at the same time as you convert the old corp into the um, the LLC. Um, if a if an S corp is involved, the new corporation. Okay, I already mentioned about this. Um, all right, so then what you do is the corporation uh, takes the LLC and contributes it to a new limited partnership, and and it gets back a general partner interest and a capital account with a preferred return. So the capital account is going to be the fair market value of the LLC's assets, um, and and that, so that's how you avoid tax, is you're getting a capital account equal value to what you put into the partnership. And you can see the two components. And it says 10% general partner and 90% limited, limited partner, but that's, that's not really quite um, the way that those 10% and 90% work. What we want to do is to make sure that the corporation, the old corporation has some skin in the game. So I like to have at least 10% of its capital account be in the capacity of a general partner that gets a sharing in the overall profits. And the balance of the capital, the other 90% or more of the capital account, is as a preferred partner then gets a preferred return. Um, so uh, my my materials go into the reasons for that, um, and and then I've got you see A, B, and C who were the original owners of the corporation. Um, they also are limited partners in the limited partnership. So as limited partners, they're not subject to self-employment tax under current law, uh, which might be changing, but we never know. Um, and and as limited partners, they, since they're not subject to self-employment tax, this is ideal. Um, anything coming from the general partner, if the general partner is an S-corp, so the S-corp blocks self-employment tax. So, I mean, they will have to pay FICA on their wages for reasonable compensation for, for the work that they do um, for the corporate general partner uh, in running the, the limited partnerships business. Um, but they um, won't have to pay any self-employment tax on on any of their distributive share of the earnings, either through the S corp or through the limited partnership. Now, one way to really drive value on this thing is a lot of people that have their family businesses. Uh, the founders do not have a non-compete agreement in place. 
and when you don't have a non-compete agreement in place, then the, the, the goodwill may very well be personal. If those founders have all these personal business connections with the client, and that's how the company gets its clients, if the founder left and started a new company and brought all of those customers with them, then what would be left in the old corporation? I mean, those assets aren't going to generate income all by themselves. They need clients. So it could be that if you don't have a non-compete in place, you can take the position that the old corporation has a very small value. And then what you do is you take those individuals who have those contacts and they sign a non-compete with a limited partnership, and then they get a partnership interest commensurate with the value of their non-compete. Um, so th they're not getting any guaranteed payments or anything like that or any licenses or anything like that. They're just getting the partnership interest in consideration. That's the value they're contributing. And C Corporation is contributing hard assets to the LLC or might contribute intangible assets in the form of workforce in place or, or, or other things. Um, but the individuals are contributing not only their blood, sweat, and tears, but also their business contacts and the non-compete agreement. Um, so you really can um, potentially strip the value out of a corporation just through this, this personal goodwill argument. Uh, and, you know, there are cases when that actually has worked out very well. There was a case called Bross Trucking where – uh, it actually, it was actually represented by a St. Louis firm. The taxpayer was, uh, and the um, dad made a lot of mistakes and uh, with the trucking company. And the trucking company really kind of needed to shut down with his business. And and he taught the trucking business to the kids, and the kids started their own trucking company. And and the IRS wanted to say that that was some kind of a transfer of the goodwill from the old corporation the dad owned to the new corporation that the kids owned. But uh, the court found that um, dad had messed it up. The old business was going to fail anyway, so there really wasn't any value that got transferred over there. All right, now we have our next polling question. Today's second secret word is green. Please select the correct secret word from the selections below. Again, today's secret word is green. Please select. Okay, I'm going to give give 10 more seconds, and then we're going to move on. Okay, I had I did have a question, by the way, from somebody who said it's more common to see people elect S classification for an LLC, and and I do see that. And in my last in my last quarter's webinar, I included why I think it's a bad idea to do that from an estate planning viewpoint. Um, so I encourage people to look at my prior newsletter um, for that. And, and then they ask if you if you're doing the F reorg and and that LLC is not selection in place, you need to do a Q sub election. Um, and I'm not uh, quite sure of that answer. Um, I just saw somebody who was doing it and in another firm and their corporate tax people um, just did the Q sub election and didn't do a form 8832 because they took the position of the Q sub election converted the LLC to a disregarded entity so then you didn't have to do anything 
to revoke the old S election for the LLC. Okay, um, base the step up or down for the partnership assets. So, um, you know, when, when you have the code section 754 election in place, then you do get the inside base to step up. And, and then, you know, what if you missed the deadline? Um, and, I mean, you do have options there. Um, yeah. Liquidate partnership, private letter ruling, sale or exchange of partnership interest. And that, that third bullet point is really the relevant one. And because the sale or exchange includes non taxable transfers. That's one of the one of the strange things about our about our tax system. A lot of people say, Oh, it's a non recognition event, therefore it's not a sale or exchange. That is not true. We have non-recognition provisions like Code Section 721 for partnerships or 351 for corporations. We have those non-recognition provisions because they are a sale or exchange when you contribute property to a business in exchange for an interest in the business. And and so there there are there are a lot of non-taxable sales or exchanges, <clears throat> and there is an argument that when you fund the downstream trust that that is a sale or exchange so in my view you really have two bites of the apple when the decedent dies the year of death that's when the partnership should make the 754 election but if it misses it and then you're funding your downstream trust you know your marital trust your credit shelter trust your trust for kids whatever those are when you're going from your revocable trust or estate into those downstream trusts for your family members you could take the position that, that is also a sale or exchange. Um, and um, you can see that third bullet point, I have um, a, a reference to something. Uh, and this is an analysis by a major partnership uh, income tax treatise. Um, if you have an unrealized built-in loss, um, then it, that can generate an inside basis step down. So, um, you're going to want to sell your lost assets if you have too much of an inside uh, built-in loss. Um, going on to this um, 2021 letter ruling, there was a corporation that had risky elements and it had a profitable subsidiary. So they wanted to separate the risky elements from the profitable subsidiary. Um, so what they did is a new parent corporation was formed, just like we illustrated in those prior slides, and the old corporation merged into this, um, this LLC that was owned by the new corporation. So the new corporation formed an LLC, and the old corporation merged into it, just like I had one of those prior slides. Um, thereby giving the new corporation the old corporation's tax attributes. So, so the merger of the subsidiary into the disregarded entity LLC gave the new corporation the old corporation's tax attributes. Again, it's an F reorganization. Um, after the, the new corporation agreed to keep the LLC solvent, the LLC then distributed the sub corporate subsidiary to the new corporation. So in other words, that old corporation, it had a subsidiary that was profitable and it had risky a assets. So when that new corporation converted into the LLC, it still had the risky assets and it had the corporate subsidiary that was profitable. And so the, the LLC went to distribute the profitable corporation, um, but you don't want the distribution to make it insolvent. You know, that would probably violate, you know, different loan provisions or fraudulent transfer rules and and possibly even some tax rules so so the the new corporation did promise to keep the llc solvent the llc that had all those risky elements and at the end of the day the new corporation had the llc the old corporation's tax attributes and owned the profit corporate subsidiary and the risky llc so then the risky llc's 
future operations were fielded um, or, or were, 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 were not something that, was, that would um, be applied to the profitable corporation's uh, business results. All right, IRS practice units. So, um, he, again, the IRS gives some um, guidance to its examiners on things to look for and, and how it approaches particular technical issues. And you can see uh, that I have, I, I do have a whole little part of my paper that has IRS practice units. It just kind of has a link to the master page for the IRS practice units. And then it has links to a certain practice units which I think might be particularly relevant to planning for a private business. And the 2020 to 2021 practice units that I kind of spotted, um, they, uh, you know, four out of five of them are partnership related. Liquidating distributions of a partnership's interest in a partnership, sale of a partnership interest, determining liability allocations, recourse versus non-recourse liabilities, all those are partnership income tax, and the IRS shows you how it approaches those issues in those practice units. And there's a separate practice unit on reasonable cause and good faith. Okay. And again, in my materials, I have a link directly to the IRS practice units page and directly to those particular uh, provisions. Now, um, just so we're not operating in a vacuum here, uh, of course, I do have my own writings on those topics. And you can see I have the exiting or dividing from a partnership are in 2Q8 and allocating liabilities is 2C3. Um, my exiting from or dividing a partnership, um, it does go into a lot of different areas and a lot of different um, issues that are arise in that area. Um, the allocating liabilities is really just kind of showing you some of the regulations in the area. It's really not um, anything a go to per that a, a go to reference, so a partnership tax ex expert is not gonna get anything out of reading my allocating liability section um, um, but there are some nuances in my exiting from or dividing a partnership section that partnership tax experts might be might find helpful um and then I also have here in the slides a link um to a webinar that I did with Bob Keebler on why it is proposals. And uh, we go through, I, I talk about um, existing law and and Bob talked, uh, mentions uh, kind of a summary of what Wyden is suggesting and I comment on, um, on the significance of that change um, if Wyden's proposals get enacted, which I sure hope that they don't, but we will see. Okay, now we're going on to today's third secret word. So we'll open up the poll. The third secret word is plain. So please co select the correct secret word from the selections below. Okay, looks like we have enough people who have answered the question uh, about plain being the third secret word. So then we are going to uh, go ahead and close the poll and move on. All right, now I'm going to talk about a trust selling its interest in an S-Corp. 
Uh, I'm going to focus on turning off grantor trust status in anticipation of the sale and, and anticipating the related post-sale reporting of income. And I'll talk just a little bit about participation in light of net investment income tax and some QSST opportunities as well. Um, so any of you who attended the ACTEC fiduciary income tax meeting, um, this is just uh, back in the fall meeting. It was last month. Uh, this is the same thing I went over. So um, those of you who attended that, um, you know, you might want to spend your time on something else. Okay. Tax allocations on, on change of an interest in business. I'm, I'm first, let me just show you the resources I have in my materials, you know, in that few thousand page PDF. So I have a, a general section on tax allocations on the transfer of stock in an S-Corp. And I also have a general section on tax allocations on the change of an interest in a partnership and changing grades or trust status. Uh, so for example, does that, um, does turning off grades or trust status, is, is that effective? at the time you turn it off, or does it have retroactive or delayed effect or anything like that? Um, and then I also talk about income tax reimbursement clauses. So um, some additional details I go into on for an S-Corp on slide 43, general rules for tax allocations on the transfer of stock in an S-Corporation. Um, and then and then I have it when you transfer less than the entire interest or when you transfer the entire interest. And I talk about death, because what would an estate planning webinar be without talking about that? Um, and, um, and I talk about a change in the qualification of the trust to hold S stock during the taxable year. So think about you have a QSST or an ESBT and you switch back and forth. So that's the topic. And, I, and I'm gonna go over a little bit about that too. Talk about distribution after transfer. So that's a smattering of the topics we're going to talk about. Um, the general rule is pro rata per share per day for an escort. So let's suppose that somebody held stock um, until December, until the beginning of December. And, and then they transfer their stock to a totally different taxpayer. So then you would take the number of days until, you know, going up to the transfer and divide that by the number of days in the year. And, and that's, you get a percentage and then you apply that percentage to all of the S corporations items. So that is the normal rule. Now, let's take an extreme example. Let's suppose on December 30th, a person transfers their stock to a different taxpayer. And on December 31st, the company is sold. So the gain from the sale of the company's assets is going to be allocated almost all to the person who transferred their stock on December 30th because they owned it for 364 out of 365 days or 365 out of 366 days. So almost all of that gain will be allocated to the person who transferred the stock, even though the gain took place after they transferred their stock. That's a very unfair result to them. And we're gonna talk about how to avoid that unfair result. Um, one minor detail, some states impose a deadline for declaring a dividend that's one or two months after the record date. So um, that person who, who transferred their stock on December 30th um, and tax distributions are made, say the following March 15th, um, they might not be able to receive a dividend uh, if the uh, if the state in which the, uh, the, the governs the corporate governance uh, has a limit on the record date because that's because March 15th is more than one or two months after December 30th. So people might want to be aware on that. But really the smart thing um, for people 
is to um, negotiate between the transfer and the transferee that the transferee gets a tax distribution that they should give that to the transferor, uh, or at least part of it, you know, whatever is attributable to the tr whatever income the transferor is picking up. So that's really the smart negotiating when you are transferring uh, S-Corp stock. Okay, so each corporate item gets a, a, a equal portion each day of the year. So I kind of went on all of that. The grantor is treated as a shareholder for the day of disposition, including the day of his or her death. Now, if you transfer the shareholder's entire interest, an accounting cutoff may be available. And the books will be treated as if the taxable year consisted of two taxable years. So in my example, somebody who transfers their stock on December 30th, you could do that accounting cutoff. And all the activity on December 31st goes to the transferee. It requires to consider the shareholder whose interest is terminated and all the shareholders to whom the shareholder has transferred shares during the year. So if A transfers stock to B, then you need to get A and B's consent. What if the corporation redeems A stock instead? Well, then all of the shareholders of the corporation um, who who are affected by this would have to consent because they are affected shareholders. Okay, so, um, and again, when you transfer the entire interest, you still use a daily probation unless you elect the accounting cutoff. And, and here's, you can see a list of items here on slide 47 about uh, different events that will allow you to do an accounting cutoff. A gift of all your stock will let you do it, um, but I have a little caveat uh, that relates to grantor trust. Um, and, and also the shareholder's death is another thing. On slide 48, conversion from a grantor trust to non-grantor trust does not qualify for the accounting cutoff. So a switch between a QSST, which is deemed owned by the beneficiary, and an ESBT, which is its own taxable taxpayer, um, that does not qualify for accounting cutoff. Even though you have different taxpayers being taxed on the S corporation's items, that does not qualify for the accounting cutoff. What about termination of grantor trust status due to death? So let's suppose you have a revocable trust and the grantor dies. Well, I don't know whether that qualifies for a county cutoff, but you can make a section 645 election that allows the revocable trust to be taxed as an estate. And so then that would be passing by reason of death. If it's an irrevocable grantor trust to begin with, and then the grantor die, the deemed donor dies, I'm not quite sure uh, what, what that status would be. Um, so we'd have to, I mean, that's that's just an unknown to me. Um, so death of the shareholder, um, you'll, you would include the date of death as part of the decedent's final individual income tax return. And the executor can consent to the cutoff Um, and again, um, QSSC or ESBT elections do not trigger an accounting cutoff. So consider whether the donor or other transfer will need to receive distributions. We already, I kind of already hit on that. Distributions to pay taxes may may really be needed for the transfer or or the donor, but. You know, you might not know it until after the corporate income tax return is filed. Um, so even then, um, if you could have a retroactive record date, you'd have to have uh, appropriate, you know, votes to agree to having a retroactive record date. So again, the idea that the transferee should pay appropriate tax distribution to the transferor is, is kind of the best line of defense. 
Um, it's just a contractual element, so um, that's the tough part. All right, changing grains for trust status. We already mentioned that there's no accounting cutoff for S corps, but partnership doesn't have those complex rules. It has a different type of set of rules, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, and then you'll see the last bullet point, portions of irrevocable grains of trust deemed owned for federal income taxation. So y you can go into a little bit more details on how the grains of trust rule, rules work. Okay, there's some particular partnership rules um, that, that talk about um, a trust distribution to the main amount on termination. Um, I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, generally, the partnership tax year does not close if you sell or exchange less than entire interest. So it's only if you have an entire change in interest. And you can see the transfer by gift doesn't close the taxable year. Um, but really with the partnerships, they go into the different types of items. Some items are required to be allocated pro rata and other things can get a cutoff. Uh, so extraordinary items will tend to have a cutoff. Um, so sometimes cutoffs or prorations are mandatory and sometimes are optional. So you just have to check the partnership rules uh, to get into that. Okay, participation in light of the net investment income tax. And of course, I always at some point have to talk about what the abbreviation NII is. Um, so NII was first foretold to be a bad word by the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, back in the 1970s. Um, so, so that would be Yeet! which is a bad word. And the, um, the tax proposals would expand the reach of the Yeet! tax. So I have a whole section that talks about application of this 3.8% tax to business income. And one of the really key things is that passive income is subject to the net investment income tax as a general rule. But one of the nice things about these passive activity rules is that to significantly uh, participate requires more than 100 hours of participation. Most people, when they think about this materially part material participation, it's more than 500 hours. And, and that rule of more than 500 hours applies to avoid passive loss treatment. When the passive activity regulations came out, the focus was on people, on preventing people from having passive income generators that can be offset by passive losses. So they wanted to make it hard to have active income. Um, I'm sorry, they wanted to make it hard to have passive income and, and easy to have, have passive losses. So it's easy to have passive losses if you don't work long enough. So that's why you have more than 500 hours. But if you work more than 100 hours, they're going to say, nope, we're not going to count that as passive income. We're going to count that as, as non-passive income. And, and so now that's come back to, hit, to haunt the IRS because um, if you work more than 100 hours, then you can avoid the net investment income tax. Okay, I have some other references there. You can read those at your own at your own leisure there. Now, what about in the context of a trust? So when you have a trust, then you want to, of course, potentially document the trustee's participation. Now, what if the trust is taxed or deemed owner under the grantor trust rules? Well, then the deemed owner needs to participate, but you still might want to have the trustee participate. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But before I do that, there's a little nuance here in this, four, in this fourth bullet point, which I didn't even focus on for most of my career. 
but um, it came up in some discussions several years ago when I was working on comments on trustees materially participating in in in, um, in activities on behalf of trust and and the issue is that um, in in many many cases a trust share of depreciation deductions can be passed through directly to the beneficiary. Instead of the depreciation going as a deduction against the trust's other income and then being passed out to beneficiaries, the depreciation is often a separately stated item that, that gets that's potentially deductible by the beneficiary. And the really unusual thing about this is that a beneficiary can deduct depreciation even if the trust doesn't have enough income to offset that depreciation. So the beneficiary can actually have a net loss from the trust during a regular year. I mean, normally, a beneficiary cannot deduct a loss except in the year of termination. But depreciation is an exception. You can deduct depreciation even if it results in a net loss. And, and that's in, in many cases. So a beneficiary who participates, so you have a non-grantor trust, you would think only the trustee's participation is relevant, and and we don't really know about uh, the depreciation. Do you count the trustee's participation or the beneficiary's? Uh, but I would I would argue, if I have a, an active beneficiary, that the beneficiary's participation counts. And I and I did I was able to save millions of dollars for taxpayers for that um, because of the beneficiary's participation. Okay, so let's think about what happens when you're selling a business versus current operations. So with a QSST, a QSST is again deemed owned by the beneficiary, and that is for the K-1 from normal operation. Now, if the company is sold, then the gain on the sale of the stock is taxed to the trust, not to the beneficiary. Now, a lot of times a company is liquidated or when you sell the stock, there's something called a 338H10 election or a 336E election. And when you make that 338H10 or 336E election, even though the stock is being sold, is treated as a sale of assets followed by a liquidation of the corporation. So in the cases when you're liquidating the company or you have um, one of these 338H10 or 336E elections being made in conjunction with the sale, then you have K-1 items that come from the sale and those are taxed to the trust, not the beneficiary. And so you need to request from the income tax return preparer for the company, you need to ask them, which of these K-1 items came from normal operations and which came from the sale? Because the normal operations um, go to the beneficiary and the sale goes to the trust. Um, and, and think about this. So the QSST sells the stock and and immediately the QSST is a separate taxpayer. So the the IRS's proposed regulations say you can look at the trustee's participation. Well, participation is supposed to be measured over a period of time, but it was deemed owned by the beneficiary until the day of the sale. So a trustee can the trustee participate for just one day? That doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. And we did some comments to the IRS about that, and the IRS has never done anything um, to comment to that really one way or another. Um, but I think that is ridiculous. Uh, but I would, but this is a reason why you you might want to have the trustee document participation, so that uh, even when you have a QSST, because if there's a sale down the road, you want to show that the trustee's been participating all along. Okay, you can see at the bottom there, I have a reference to 2K2, 
which is my reference for uh, participation by trust. Okay, and then we've got um, a, a series of uh, parts of my material that go over um, the, the material participation issues and the net investment income tax issues. So they are all listed out for you on slide 60. Um, now I'm going to go to this unique opportunity, which is especially available for QSSTs, and, and that's the idea of an equitable adjustment. So we know with an S corporation that a QSST is deemed, you know, beneficiary is the deemed owner, and they're going to get taxed on every dime that the S corp earns every year. But the S corp will often reinvest those earnings. So the beneficiary is paying the income tax, but the earnings get reinvested and they're really going to benefit the remainder men down the road because now the principal asset of the S Corp stock has increased in value from that reinvestment. Well, there's really two ways to look at this. On the one hand, the corporation may be making distributions specifically so that the owners can pay their income taxes. And in fact, that is what typically happens. So one could say, well, the beneficiary is not out of pocket a single dime because they're getting tax distributions. On the other hand, out of fairness, they did pay tax on those reinvested earnings, so maybe the beneficiary should get credit for it. So when you sell the business and, and you're looking at, the, at what the trust gets taxed for that capital gain, uh, and by the way, a lot of times that that's going to be a code section 1231 asset, you know, like an asset using a trade or business, um, that's capital gain. And, and that, that capital gain from the, uh, for a code section 1231 asset is not considered to be the sale of a capital asset. So that capital gain is automatically included in distributable net income. So, so this capital gain is automatically included in distributable net income, unlike a lot of other capital gain. And, and so you have an opportunity here um, that you, you, you're looking after the fact and preparing your income tax return for the trust that sold the, that sold the, that sold the stock. Uh, and, and you're thinking, well, how much, uh, and it was even to sell those assets too. So, so how much of that gain um, would it make sense to tax the beneficiary versus taxing it to the trust? And it could be that you have beneficiary who's in a lower tax bracket than the trust would be. And it would and it might make sense, you know, depending on whether it's appropriate to make a distribution of beneficiary, it might make sense to have that income tax to the beneficiary. Well, since QSSTs generally are mandatory income trusts, the trustee can make an equitable adjustment. When the fiduciary income tax return is being prepared, the, the, the preparer can go to the, to the trustee and say, hey, if you make a fiduciary adjustment, if you make an, an, an equitable adjustment here, you can allocate some of this gain to the mandatory income, and then that passes through to the beneficiary. So this is not a 65-day rule thing. This is a mandatory income thing. So the mandatory income thing can be done anytime before the tax return is, is, is filed. So anyway, that's my hot tip on, on QSSTs. On slide 62, we have links to various webinars, and, and I encourage you to sign up if you're not already signed up. Um, there was a person who asked me about why this bill, and um, the link that I have there goes to, would, would go to this Lineberg webinar um, that I did with Bob Keeper. It doesn't go to the bill itself. Um, uh, but uh, you know, so so I don't I don't have that handy for you. Uh, but anyway, um, here's your list of links. I encourage people to sign up. Um, that last the next slide bullet point January 25th webinar for fourth quarter newsletter because this is the one for the third quarter. So January 25th webinar for the fourth quarter newsletter. Um, so I look forward to uh, future contact with you. Thank you for participating in our webinar. 
please complete and submit the survey that we'll display at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, thank you very much. Good luck with the new tax bill. And I look forward to further communication with you. Have a good day.